and um, it's a great pleasure, I must say, to be in uh, Galway and, and to have the opportunity of, of speaking to you. Um, always at the beginning of these sessions, I, I'm very conscious that you have accents and I don't. And I hope that the accent, uh, your accent, is not going to get in the way of any dialogue that we might have, so, because I... I see this as essentially about a, a dialogue about community knowledge, not a lecture or anything very formal. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I maybe should, should say at the beginning, I, I um, about two years ago, was invited to do a, a talk in Scotland. Um, at that time, in Scottish education, we had, and, and my background is Scottish education, for the absence of doubt, that is different from English education. Now, I, I could spend the rest of the afternoon happily talking about what the differences are. Um, basically, Scottish education is developed by looking at what they do in England and doing the opposite. <laughs> this has kept us a very civilised country. Uh, but one of the things I was asked to do two, two or three years ago now was part of a debate about the future of Scottish education. And one of the aspects of this that the government decided was that they would have a number of people going round communities, I suppose you could think of it as community knowledge, and talking to people in evenings in various places. Now, I should let it be known that uh, one of Ian's uh, places of great, um, he's made great contribution to the community is Paisley. Well, I was asked to do a talk at Paisley Town Hall on a wet Thursday evening uh, at about 7.30 in the evening uh, to an audience talking about the future purposes of Scottish education. And five of us was asked, were asked to do this uh, little presentation. We had the audience outnumbered, but about... Halfway through the presentation, there was a lady who came in with various plastic bags, and she had clearly decided that a little refreshment before um, coming to this session would be desirable. So she sort of stumbled through the chairs uh, with her bags, and of course, when you're giving a presentation on the philosophy of Scottish education, you should a little put off, a bit off-putting, this sort of thing. However, in the... Um, question time that we had afterwards, you could see this lady was clearly animated in all sorts of ways. And um, when the person who was convening the evening asked if there were any questions, this lady was the first one to put her hand up. She said of the contribution I had made, she said, that was, that was, abso that was, ab that was absolutely superb. That was, absol that was absolutely superfluous. <laughs> um, so I consider this to be something of a compliment. You know, you take what compliments you can. So I hope that what I say this afternoon is not going to be absolutely superfluous. But I hope that uh, what it will do is maybe just raise a few issues about community knowledge and about what we're trying to do in terms of engagement with the community. There is a handout, the, which if anyone wishes it, or I see some of you have it, that's a great problem for me because it then gives the impression I have to go through it. Um, and I won't go through this in detail, but what I want to do is just to maybe raise from it a number of issues that I think might be of interest to you, um, of significance, and, and to hopefully have a conversation about aspects of community knowledge. To begin that, I think it's sometimes useful in looking at issues associated with education. And my own background is the education of teachers um, from a Scottish point of view. That's what I've spent my, my life engaged in, in looking at teacher education. And I suppose one of the things that I've found in my uh, Recent, in the recent year and a half since I stopped being dean at Glasgow University, is a sense of freedom to think about what education is. And I, I'll come back to that notion of freedom to think um, as we go through this brief presentation, because I think 
actually that's at the heart, something at the heart of community knowledge is the freedom to think. Thinking and freedom. I believe that if, if you were to look at um, some aspects of uh, community knowledge, what I want to just comment on right at the beginning is what is the purpose of education or what is the purpose of university? And I think it's about the flourishing of humanity. I also profoundly believe that people engaged in education nowadays have lost the capacity to know the difference between means and ends. Let me just tell you a little story about that. Some years ago, about five years ago, I was asked if I would do some work with the government of India. And I'm going to refer to a few of my sort of bits and pieces of work, either in Scotland or, or other, in other parts of the world. But asked to do some work with the government of India on developing a five-year plan for education in India. And a colleague of mine who came from the University of Leuven in Belgium and myself were asked to go to India uh, and help the government. And the government of India had a very curious way of dealing with this. They thought that if you're going to write a plan, it's as well to know something about what you're writing it for. Now, I had worked in a teacher education institution and had years written plans in it without knowing too much about what actually was going to be all about. But there you are, the government of India felt we should know about the subject matter we were writing a plan for. So what they um, did was they sent um, myself and this guy to a, a school. We went from Delhi to Patna, which is in the east of India, and then we went about a day's drive um, south of, of Patna. Do come and have a seat there. I'm kind of not used to this. I'm much more used to an audience leaving and I don't know how to welcome someone who comes into a room um, halfway through a talk. Anyway, you're welcome, Sharon. I don't want to embarrass you by um, <laughs> slipping gently into the audience. I hope by the end of the afternoon we'll have insulted just about everybody and you'll all feel equally included in the insult. Where was I? India. Went to a school. When we went to a school, I don't want to portray all of education in India like this, but it was a very interesting experience for me going to a school in India. We went into a school. We arrived one morning, and the room that we were in was a fairly large room. I maybe I don't know, four or eight times as big as this room. Um, and we were told to come in, and when you were in the room, as you looked out you look down to a big puddle uh, from, from the uh, building, just one, one room, the, the school. You look down, and there's a big puddle, paddy fields, and then there was a rise up and a plateau. And on the plateau, there were about nine or ten cattle, as I, I collected. Of course, cattle are all over India, sacred cattle, and they're walking around. So. That plateau was the site of the first university in the world the University of Nalanda in India, established about 3000 BC, went out of existence about 1000 AD, at its peak had about 10,000 students. Still uh, not fully excavated as an archaeological site. Very interesting a place to be. And so the school's looking out on this, and there are these men bent double transplanting rice. In the school, told to come in, told to have a seat on the carpet, on the ground, no chairs, and he was told, make sure you don't sit on a snake. That keeps you awake for the morning, <laughs> I can tell you. You're sort of sitting there thinking, of course, after 20 minutes, a wee guy gets up with a stick and a snake in the end of the oh, God. <laughs> so, anyway, there we are, sitting, watching that there's no snakes. Um, thank God for St. Patrick and all he did um, in Ireland, where you don't have that problem today. Um, so, we're sitting there, and then... And there were 174 children in this room, one teacher. And then I was told a very interesting thing. This teacher cannot read or write. So, here's yes, sort of wondering, <laughs> thought education maybe had something to do with reading and writing. And that experience had a profound effect on me. Because it raised the question as I sat there. What is education actually all about? 
Is that about reading and writing? And it occurred to me that day, education is not about reading and writing. Education is about something much deeper. It's about the flourishing of humanity, and it's about the formation of people. And what was going on in that room in India with 174 children in desperate poverty? And let me give you an illustration of the poverty in that room. There were three children in that room who had no name. These were children who had been abandoned by their parents, limbs broken when they were begging for money when they were infants, and then abandoned. And they had no name. Now, I had never witnessed that poverty. The poverty of no name is, to me, an extraordinary phenomenon. And, you know, if I were to go back to that school, I think I would at least have given these kids a name. Anyway, so you're looking at this poverty, and you're looking at what's happening in education, and what occurred to me at that time was the curriculum is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. That's what that taught me, that reading and writing is a means to be educated, but it's not the purpose of education. And it raises the question, of course, what is the purpose of education? And I think the purpose of education is the flourishing of humanity. It's about forming people, not necessarily just informing them. Forming people of love, care and compassion. People with a sense of hope. People with a sense of beauty and wonder and who will serve the world by their gifts. That's what I think it is to be educated. And I sometimes wonder whether we have lost that way of thinking. That sense that education, the educated person, is someone with love, care and compassion, with a sense of hope, I'll come on to that shortly, a sense of beauty and wonder, and who will serve the world by their gifts. Reading and writing and the curriculum helps you to do that. So what is community knowledge? It's about the flourishing of humanity. It's about two things in our contemporary world, I think. I think it is something to do with personal and social well-being. And, for those who are involved in formal education, it's something to do with attainment and achievement. And these are not alternatives. That's the critical thing. Community knowledge is both about the inner self and the ability to work with others. Now you might say, oh, this is all very high-flown. But you know, if you don't have a vision or a mission in what you're doing, you're going to be subject to government accountability and nothing else. And you're the danger is that education gets driven by weird views of government about measured outcomes and all that stuff. So let's not be driven by systems of accountability, but be driven by a vision of what community knowledge is trying to do. And I think that, for me, this is at the heart of what, what it's about. It's the person at the heart of community knowledge. What I believe to be important is to see this in the great sweep of life, and we, we could spend a lot of time on this, and I will not do that. I think sometimes, you know, if you look at the last hundred years, that for the first half of the 20th century, sort of human endeavour was about extending the body. It was about going faster, going higher, going further, exploring the world, you know, land speed records, records of aircraft, which you now don't hear too much about, but you know that, that was the sort of obsession of um, humanity and, and culture at that time. I think from the 1960s onwards, what we we found is that the the chip. And I, if I was doing that in, this in Glasgow, I'd have to say I'm not talking about fish and chips here. Um, the development of the chip, uh, which in Glasgow they're experts on the chip and the deep fried Mars bars and a few other little savouries. But the extension of the mind, you know, since the 1960s, we've really been looking at the evolution of computing. Knowledge. Knowledge is now at our fingertips. So when one talks about community knowledge, it's not about information. Information is on computers everywhere. 
So what is it we're trying to do? To, to be educated is not just to be knowledgeable. There is a book written, and I commend it to you. It, it's got a somewhat modest title, which is um, How the Scots Invented the Modern World and Everything in It. Uh, you know, one of the aspects, that, there are books about Irish um, society too, I know, but there is this book called How the Scots Invented the Modern World and Everything in It. <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting book. A really interesting book. You should read this book. It's, and it's a serious book. I mean, that's one of the curiosities. It's a very se it's a thesis on what, how, how did the Scots invent the modern world. And the kind of thesis that it really is proclaiming is, I mean, Scotland is a place that, I suppose, did invent the modern world, really. You've got to be... The, the one thing about Scottish education that has tremendous quality, and I think it's maybe... Let's set aside Irish education, which I actually see as a very a very, very interesting education system you have in Ireland. And I would say one of the best in the world. Possibly second best. <laughs> that said, I'm, I'm kind of reminded when I say that of, of a, um, a radio programme um, in the UK where uh, just before Christmas there was a programme asking the question, what is the second most important city in the United Kingdom? And of course, you get people from Edinburgh phoning up and saying, it must be Edinburgh, capital city. And people from Cardiff phoning up and saying, oh, of course, it's got to be Cardiff. And people from Belfast making their claim. Got to pushing it a bit when you get to that point. Um, and people from Birmingham phoning up and saying, it's got to be Birmingham, second largest city. Someone from Glasgow phoned up and said, the second most important city in the United Kingdom is London. So, um, with that thought, uh, <laughs> you know, we're talking about what are the uh, Irish education system and the Scottish education system. When talking about how did the Scots invent the modern world, the thesis of that book is that in developing knowledge, indeed you might say community knowledge, up until the mid middle part of the 18th century, Universities, like the University of Glasgow, were places which, when, when Glasgow University was founded, which was 1451, don't say you're not getting some really great information here, mm -hmm. Glasgow University founded 1451, that was the year before any book was ever published. first book was published in 1452, year before Christopher Columbus was born as well, just to set it in context. And Glasgow University, um, when you're, you're made a professor in the university, one of the things about medieval universities is a professor in the university was someone who knew everything. Now, some things don't change much. A professor knew everything. Isn't that an amazing thing, to think that you know everything? How you get your head around that, I don't know. But professor knew everything. And that was their job, to know everything. And, of course, in those days, you taught... Latin, Greek, uh, philosophy, music, mathematics, language. But there wasn't that much to know. There were no books. So it was perfectly possible to have a, a concept of knowing everything. Now, of course, as books began to get published, how can you know everything? Until the middle part of the 18th century when they said, well, look, we're going to have to sit down. What is worth knowing? And professors in Glasgow and Edinburgh sat down and said, well, what is worth knowing? And what they did was they wrote what was worth knowing down and they put it under the headings of philosophy, theology, music, the arts, science, so on and so on. And then they published it in 1756. And the, that was the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That was what was worth knowing. And it's well worth having a look at the first edition. That's what's worth knowing. And of course it raises a question to be educated was to know that. What was in the Encyclopedia Britannica. First edition. Now, wouldn't it be ridiculous to think that to be educated today is to have read the Encyclopedia Britannica? 
mean, what a daft idea that is. Because to be educated is not about knowledge of that kind. It's about something very different. And one of the things that that raises is questions about the way education has changed. You know, it's not about knowledge. And we could spend a long time debating the question, what is it to be an educated person? Now, I could ask you to just reflect for a moment or two, who's the most educated person you know? Is it one of your colleagues? Is it your mother or your father? Is it, is it um, a sibling? Is it someone who taught you at university? Is it someone that you've heard on television? Is it, who's the most educated person you know? I guarantee when I say that, nobody is thinking who has got the best results in their leaving certificate. You don't think of that as necessarily the, the educated person. You, you're using other criteria like who helped me in my life, or who serves society best, or something. And it does raise a, that does raise a question, what are schools and universities about? Are they really about education? Or are they about certification? And I want to say to you, they are about education, and therefore they're about community knowledge, as being right at the heart of it, because they're about service to other people, about helping other people. And one of the things about universities and other places like that is they can very easily become isolated, remote institutions which do not serve the communities that they have been set up to serve. And community knowledge has to be much more part of that. So, extension of the mind. But I think what's going to happen in the future is we need an extension of the spirit. We've extended the body, we've extended the mind. But have we extended relationships? There is no time more needed when people have to get on better with each other. We live in a very divided society, and universities and people involved in community should pay attention to the whole person, not just to the, to the data and knowledge, not just to, to, to the mechanics of life. And I think that's the future of education, actually dealing with the spirit with the depth of humanity, getting a real understanding of humanity. That's what it is to be educated. So, in the broad sweep of what we're doing, we ought to pay attention to these ideas, looking at community knowledge as about helping the spirit of the people. And not being slow, timorous, afraid, to talk about the spirit. To talk about what it is that is deep in the heart of the human being. The deep in the heart of the human condition. And I think that that's where education must work and push itself. To be developing more about how do we get on together and who are we as people. I think myself that when I look at uh, education, the driving force for an effective education for me is a world of hope. It's driven by hope, and its purpose is to develop a world of justice. Now, what do I mean by justice? I don't just mean conformity to the law. When I am doing this little seminar, I do ask myself the question, what does justice look like in this room? You are busy people. You're, you've got a lot on your plate, you've got exams to mark, you've got things to do, you've got things to prepare. You've done me the privilege of coming in here today, spending a little time here. If what I was saying was a complete waste of your time, that would be an injustice. And all of you must feel part of that. All of you must feel that there's something in it for you. If it's not, it's an injustice. So justice is about paying attention to the needs of everyone who, in whom you're in a professional relationship. It's, it's how you, we all together can help each other. 
I think that's what it is to deal with justice. And it means that the teacher, when, you, when you're looking at teaching and learning, how are we being just to the students that we have, to every one of them? What does justice look like to them? We need to think a bit more about that. Because if you don't have a sense of justice, you'll have a sense of injustice. And that will not lead to the peaceful heart. And it, that does seem to me to be a violence to the individual. Of course, one can look at things like uh, this little quote, that justice has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at what injustices there are, and the courage to do something about it. quote from St. Augustine, if you're looking for a source. It's a very interesting quote to me, that. That justifiable anger at the injustices of the world and the courage to do something about it. Now, I come from Glasgow, and Glasgow is a city which isn't the same as Galway. Um, since this is being recorded, I'm going to have to watch what I say here. <laughs> uh, things that you we talk about community knowledge, and what is the community? I was in a debate recently with the chief medical officer for Scotland that he pointed out in the west end of Glasgow, affluent part of Glasgow, life expectancy for a male is 81 years of age. The east end of Glasgow, poor area of Glasgow, life expectancy 43. 43 years of age. Now, in the Gaza Strip, where they're shooting each other, life expectancy is 65. What is the implication of that for professional people? What's the implication of that for a university? What should the university be doing about that? Should you just be collecting the data and saying how interesting? Or should you say, we have a responsibility? We have a, not only a responsibility, we have a professional, ethical responsibility to look at the injustice that is implied by that statistic. And that's that kind of crude statistic, if you like. You know, it's, it's just giving you one indicator. Does a university have a responsibility? I think the answer to that is yes. What can it do about it? What it can do about it is talk to people in Glasgow, look at the research. How do you go over that problem? What is it the basis of the problem? Now, I think, myself, the basis of that problem is that there are communities in the east end of Glasgow who, where there are children growing up who have no effective role model of an adult, where family life has fallen apart. There's no role model of, of an adult, and what is really needed is small groups of children to be with a responsible adult and to develop a, a, a loving relationship with that adult. And I'm not talking about parenting, I'm not talking about teaching necessarily, I'm not talking about social, but who are the responsible adults that they can have a relationship with? Because if they did have a relationship that brought them dignity in their lives, they would have a different outlook in life. At present, I see them living in very disturbed societies where they're living in difficult family circumstances or home circumstances, I should perhaps say, where they have no role model, where they don't know what they don't know right from wrong. They've got no sense of, of uh, communication, of graciousness, or anything of that kind. And I think we have a responsibility to say, look, why not develop systems and, and procedures, and it's not just systems, it's relationships that are going to lead to a better life. I think the university does have a responsibility to say, that community knowledge in a, in a needs to be brought somehow to that community. That knowledge needs to be brought to that community for the benefit of everyone. It's not just a question of looking at it and saying that's interesting or not. It's a question of doing, it's doing something, it's the engagement. And it's moving from knowledge as a, a, an inert kind of set of data to actually making a difference. And I think that that's the person at the heart of community knowledge. It's getting into the community, engage in the community, involved in it for the benefit of everyone. I should say, of course, one shouldn't be complacent about the 81-year-olds in the West End. 
Because they're living in societies where they're living with chronic illness for the last 15 years of their life, where they're living in isolation, some of them living in, in circumstances that are not ideal. We can be doing things for them too. So I'm not suggesting that there is the haves and the have-nots and it's all right for the haves and it's not all right for the have-nots. I'm not suggesting that. And I'm certainly not demonising the East End of Glasgow or any community in it. All I'm saying is, what's our responsibility? And we do have a responsibility to be human. If we, if we really passionately believe in the flourishing of humanity, how can you live with those differences? Now I take Glasgow as an example. Can one see the same in Galway or in rural poverty, in areas of rural poverty? Can one see you know, the flourishing of humanity in, the, in, the, in Connemara? Does NUI Galway have a responsibility for any of that? I'm just raising that as a question. It seems to me a legitimate question when you're looking at community knowledge and the service of a university it's the service, the, the responsibility of a university in its wider society. And it's local society, it's also looking at world trends and contributing to those as well. So it's just that this sort of sense of, of being angry at the injustices and the courage to do something about it. It's, it's a, such an important, deep human thing to do. And universities maybe have to be a bit more courageous about it. I'll just very briefly go through some of these things now because I'm anxious that, um, you know, and I should have said to you, you know, do um, ask questions as I, go, as I go through this now. I'm nearly finished, there's no point in asking that. <laughs> of course, I will see it as an interruption and a sort of attention seeking behaviour. <laughs> we'll get you a bit of therapy if you need that, but feel free to, to have the conversation. But I just think that, that what it's important to, to look at is that. We ought to be trying to develop relationships at the heart, at the heart of knowledge. I also think, um, just this is just a, a, a sort of slightly idle thought, but maybe one that, that comes into some of the reflections as I reflected on what community knowledge actually is. I think community knowledge challenges some of the models that are well built into uh, some of the social sciences. And I particularly want to just look at that issue. We've got really into a world, I think we've let psychologists away with murder for years. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be psychologists here, I'm, I'm, I'm into insulting somebody. I think we've let psychologists away with murder. They talk about stages of development. And you can look at that under you know, Piaget's stages of development, Fowler looking at uh, spiritual and moral development, Kohlberg's moral development, and they're all about what stage are you at. Is that the right model? And in fact, is it, is it a reasonable model? When I look at uh, issues in relation to the work uh, that, that um, you're likely to be about, I think it's perhaps more interesting to look at knowledge as strands of knowledge, strands of experience. Not stages, but strands that run together. They're not sequential. They're actually running together at, at the same time, almost like a bit of sort of rope or wool or something. And the more uh, pieces you, you put together, the stronger it gets. And they run together. And the more experiences you get, the stronger it gets. And I think that that's perhaps more a more useful conceptualization of knowledge than of stages. You get the point? That yes. the, 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 what I'm really saying is that a lot of these run at the same time. That they're not sequential. They're, that they're actually running at the same time. And, and I don't know of anyone who's written too much about this. Um, and I just put it to you as I thought, what, about, what is this community knowledge about? What it is about is adding strands to thought and to experience. It's adding strands of experience and strengthening the rope of life. That's how I kind of conceptualize it. And I think there's something maybe in that that is well worth having a look at by somebody. And since you 
obviously sit on the under the trees in Galway through these long summers from <laughs> April to September, sipping Murphy's or something. <laughs> yeah, just reflecting on some of the things of life. Maybe you could reflect on that as a little thought. Is life all about stages or about strands? You know, when I go to airports and things like that, these are the sort of things I think about. I sit in, um, you know, at airports you get these seats and, and people sit down beside you. And sometimes I say to people beside me, you know, do, do you th probably tomorrow in Dublin Airport, I mean, do you think that really the nature of <laughs> community knowledge is essentially about stages or strands? Would you take that in Glasgow? In Glasgow, oh, they talk, they talk about little else in Glasgow. Airport, I can tell you. Usually it gives you an extra seat beside you. You know, they get up and walk away. You can put your bag on it and that's you, quite happy. So, anyway, there you are. Just, you know, you might want to reflect on that. These long, I can't imagine what it's like. It must be superb in Galway. All that beautiful sunshine all the time. So, there we are. Um, is human development about stages or is it about strands, as a thought? Um, and I think that what you're doing, actually, may be about strands and someone should be writing about it. And, and how one strand relates to the other, because the, these are not just loose strands. But now, what binds them together? What, what makes that rope, or wool, or whatever the metaphor might be? Um, what you also require to do, of course, in that is to engage in civic listening. Because this isn't a, a, a one-way process of some, developing something in the university and, and banging it out into the community. It's also about listening. How do you listen to society? If you're going to engage in community knowledge, you have to know what, how the people are thinking, what they're thinking, what their concerns are, and, and all of that. And so this is a, a very much a, a two-way process concerned with relationships. I'll just go through some of these quite, quite quickly. The other thing that I, I think um, what the community knowledge begins to highlight in my thinking is that community knowledge... Um, has two main elements to it. One, are, one is the, what you could say the aspirations of education. I'm passionate about saying to people, knowledge is not found on bits of paper. It's not found on examination sheets. It's not found in the written form. Knowledge is in here. It's in your heart and it's in your mind. That's where you find knowledge. Knowledge isn't anywhere else. And don't be um, put off with the, the idea that knowledge is written down. Information is written down. Knowledge is... So community knowledge is, is incarnate people. It's got to be live, dynamic, changing, organic. And knowledge is not the same in any people, because we're all different experiences. So it's incarnated in people. What I'm interested in, I think, is that when you deal with knowledge, you can have these aspirations, these are all the not only about that, it's about how you get from here to there. And that's about a journey. And that's about means and means, about means and means, knowing the difference. And that, that's where government falls down dramatically. What it's dealing with is all the aspirations and the end points as they see it. What they don't talk about is the method of getting there. And that's where I think people themselves interested in the community and have to look at a variety of ways of getting there. Different for each person. What to think about that? The whole area of relationships is therefore very important. We've got to get beyond curriculum content. I mean, the idea, you know, people talk about, when I, when I listen to, to people in schools in particular, they say, we've got to cover the curriculum. God help us. What is all that about? Cover the curriculum. Coverage is the enemy of thought. Don't just cover the curriculum. Universities are desperate at this. You know, get through the curriculum. Coverage. What, is, what model does people that use that language have in mind? Far less deliver the curriculum. What model do they have in mind? Answer none. People who talk like that don't know what they're talking about. Because you can't deliver a curriculum. A curriculum is the interaction, the dynamic, organic interaction of people with each other. That's what it's all about. That's what education... Yet, what the, what the government documents, they're full of things like coverage, 
deliver. And you think, this is, this is the wrong model. It's the wrong way of thinking. It's not this organic human way of, of working. And let me just go on to um, just one or two things. What do universities do? They teach. They do research. Critically, they're involved in consultancy. And they are involved in service. Four areas. Remember consultancy and service. Teaching and research is what, is what you hear all the time. In fact, what you hear all the time nowadays is, where are we getting money for research? Absolute mission in universities. What they're not concerned with is service to the community. And I think they need to spend more time on that issue of where are they serving the communities. And we've uh, banged on about that long enough for a better world. Let me just... Oh, um, what I want to do with this, since you've got it in your... Why did I put it in there? What I'd like to do is focus on that. This is the Michelangelo's view of creation from the Sistine Chapel. And the hand of... Uh, Adam and the hand of God. The centerpiece of the Sistine Chapel is space. If you're going to be creative, you need space. We live in a world of control. You know, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if Michelangelo had met Mrs. Thatcher. The mind boggles. I suspect what would have happened is he wouldn't have drawn a diagram like that, or, or a painting like that. He'd have the hands joined. Modern thinking would have joined those hands to be a hand of control. And you wouldn't know who's controlling whom. We need autonomy, we need space, we need to recognize that the only way of being creative in our knowledge, and creativity should be at the heart of it, and Irish society will thrive on its creativity. It can't thrive on its material resources. Because once you've stripped the turf off the top of the soil, you don't have much left. It's going to th thrive on creativity, the brains of the country. And that needs space. And space is not emptiness. Think of space. I also would say to you, where is that in your own lives? Where is the space in your life to be creative? Staff at university need space to be creative. And to use a very Scottish phrase, you can't give what you've not got. Now, I know the Scots don't give what they do have. I grant you that. That's their <laughs> reputation. But... <laughs> Ian, I'm sorry I'm insulting <laughs> both of us. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> but you can't give what you've got. So where's the space in your life to be creative? Because community knowledge is also about giving space to the community. And universities should provide that space for, for the creative impulse of society. Just to move on very quickly, we also have to get away from ideas of compromise. Good gracious, who wants ever to be thought of as competent? I mean, it's such a, a basic thing, you know, competence. It would drive you mad to think of this. You know? and, and you see all sorts of stuff in universities about quality, and then they send competences. As soon as you s express competences, you deflate aspirations and you deflate creativity. It's the antithesis of quality. Discuss. <laughs> it's a good MA question that. A cult we have to move away from a culture of accountability. We're dominated by a culture of accountability. And we need a culture of responsibility. Be responsible for what you do. And if you're responsible, you'll be accountable. But don't be driven by some notions of accountability. Let me just tell you another little story, if I've got time for this, and I'll just do a couple of other things and then we'll have, have conversations, I hope. About last November, um, I had to be, and I hope this is not going to be a touchy story as far as Irish people are concerned, 
I was having breakfast, as one does, uh, with a guy, and he was a selector for the Australian rugby team in 1999 when they won the World Cup. And I was interested in leadership. So I'm interested in leadership and how, you know, how, do, you, how do you look at leadership? And one of the things I, I said to him, John, you were, a, you were a selector for the Australian rugby team. What criteria did you use to select players that became world champions? He said, well, you're asking the wrong question. I said, oh, what would the right question? He said, the right question would be, how did Australia win the World Cup? I said, well, how did Australia win the World Cup? You see, it was a kind of intellectual conversation. <laughs> so, how did Australia win the World Cup? He said, well, I'll tell you the story. That's very good of you. So, and I would really tell you how they won the World Cup. He said, what happened was that they knew they had a good rugby team, and he said, but they, and they had beaten New Zealand in, in several games in 1998, 1997, and they'd beaten South Africa. So they knew that they, they were doing well in the Southern Hemisphere, but they hadn't played any Northern Hemisphere team. So they decided that they would come to the Northern Hemisphere and play France. So they, had, they set up three games in 1998 against France. And so a series of three games, they had win, to win at least two. So run this fast forward, get to Paris, first game, Australia win. Great, only got to win one more game. And that's then won the series. So, play the second game, they get beaten. Now, you've got to use, I had to use my imagination. I expect you'll have to use, use yours here. Um, he said they had some intelligent players in that team. Australia rugby, intelligent players. Didn't add up to me, but anyway, there you go. So, he said they had some quite intelligent players. What they did was, at the end of that game, they sat down and said, why did we get beaten in that game? And they looked at what happened. Their psychology was they had to win the game. And the game went something like this. The details don't really matter. But the game went something like this. Australia scored first, 3-0. France scored, 5-3. France scored again, 8-3. 8-3 to France. The Australians are looking at the scoreboard. We've got to win this game. Australia scored again, 8-6. Then it went to 18-6 to France as they scored. And the Australian team thought, 18-6, 12 points. How are, we going to score? How are we going to get these points? And they said that then what seemed to happen was the Australians started to drop the ball, miss passes, not get the ball at the line. You know, just things went to pieces. And eventually France won something like 32-20. How did we lose that? And what they recognised was the first game, they played good rugby. The second game, they chased the scores. And when they started chasing the scores, they had no strategy to close the gap. They were just looking at the scoreboard and saying, we've got to get 12 points. How do we get those 12 points? We don't have a strategy. We've just got to get the points. But we don't know how to do it. And he said, what they recognised was, do the right things and results will follow. Never do it in reverse. Never look for scores in the presumption you're doing the right things. It won't happen. Because you'll have no strategy for doing the right things. And you know, I think that's a very interesting metaphor for education. I look at measured outcomes. And someone says to you, I want 5% better next year. How do you do it? Do the right things and the results will follow. I mean, it's such an interesting metaphor. Do the right things, the results will follow. I think people in community, uh, knowledge and development, do the right things for the community and results will follow. Don't start with results. Don't start with accountability. Because you'll never improve if you only look at accountability. What you need is to start with a sense of responsibility. And responsibility means do the right things. Do the right things and the results will follow. A last little thought. Um, oh, do you want to know about benchmarks? No, no neither do I. I, mean, I, <laughs> I was once involved in doing all this stuff. Actually, the only, inter the only useful thing about this is benchmarks for any professional education, knowledge, skills, but never forget the values. 
That's the heart of any professional education. Any university education that doesn't pay attention to that is going to be caught in an absolutely arid debate between <coughs> theory and practice. And I suspect that in community knowledge, developing community knowledge, is about what about the university and what about society? And it's a debate about internal, external. Arid debate. Look at the values. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to do? That's what will drive it away from that bottom line into something of significance. That's all that's about. And you can measure that by looking at all this sort of stuff, you know, as you progress. If you thought of that as a Toblerone bar, and as you move up the Toblerone bar. So when you're assessing teachers, for example, use the Toblerone bar. And you can, what you can do is, you can, with experience, you can look at the cross-cut of that. I'm quite attracted by the Toblerone bar because there's a lot of nuts in it. <laughs> Teacher education. A lot of nuts. And, a bit, and a, it also gets a wee bit sweeter as you go up. You know, a bit more honey in it. Um, and you, you can look at that at different points. Um, and you're looking at values, knowledge, and, and anyway, that's what the benchmarks are all about. If you want to know more about that, then see a therapist. Um, if, you, if you do want to know more about that, I'd be very happy to talk to you about how, did, how was that constructed for professional people. Because actually I think it's a very interesting way of, of looking at, at some of that. Um, what I will do is just go, you can read the stuff yourself. Whenever I put that up, I see people's eyes blaze. Could I just ask you, at this point, if you would nudge the person beside you and waken them up? For no more than two minutes, and I'll try and make life... This will change your life for the better. Two minutes is all I ask of you, and then we'll stop. A model of learning. How do people learn? Well, you've got to use a bit of imagination. If you think of that as a double helix... Okay? Two strands. When you teach, you teach two things. Content, the stuff of education, the knowledge, the skills, the ideas, concepts, and so on. So, so you're trying to teach, you teach knowledge. But also, at the same time, when you're teaching, you teach people to love what you're teaching. These are the two things. So, if you took this pathetic little example of teaching at the moment. There was some content, not a lot, I hear you say, but there you go. Some content, but also there's an emotional bit about it. You know, there's, it, it's love or hate it. And actually, if you teach and people hate what you're teaching, they won't learn. And let me be very simplistic about this. Supposing you're trying to teach reading to, to a, a child, and you're teaching the cat sat on the mat. Okay? That's the, the content, word recognition or letter recognition, however they, however they do it. But you also want them to love reading. You just enjoy it. Now, which is the more important? It seems to me self-evident that if they love it, they'll do it. And that's not rocket science. If they like it, they'll do it. How many people think of just the love of learning and the curious mind, the development, when you're looking at community knowledge, get people to want to learn, to love learning, to, to have a curiosity, an appropriate curiosity. Now, I do sit at airports and say to people, what do you think li links the knowledge to the love of learning? And we sit at the airport and have discussions about this at Glasgow Airport. And I have concluded that that is about relationships. People le learn through the smiling eyes of the teacher. That's what they learn. You can read all the books you like. I see you've got a magnificent library here. No doubt stuffed full of interesting books. No doubt. Not the librarian, is it? <laughs> In Glasgow University, I should tell you this story. That should be turned off at this point. We, we occasionally, in the Senate of the University, which is the primary decision-making body in the University, we had a debate about two years ago 
And this all started from someone failing an examination, a, a PhD in sociology. And the Dean of Theology stood up at the set, and when they appeal against that, they, they, they appeal to the full Senate with the normal consequences, as you might imagine. Um, in this particular case, this person failed a PhD in sociology, and the Dean of Theology stood up to give an impassioned plea for this student. He said, you know, this is a red-letter day for this university. Here is someone in sociology who has actually failed an examination. Usually people pass that with being able to write their name and scratch a few things on paper and they get degrees in sociology and they get master's degrees for being able to read sauce bottles. And so he went on in this sort of slightly eloquent and, you know, you have to say controversial way and made the point that he thought that this was a... Um, that the Senate had to take this very seriously because in the university library, which is a... As he pointed, he said to the principal, in the University of Glasgow, we now have a great library, uh, 12 stories high, and you go in, and it's a magnificent place, full of computers. Not a bloody book in sight, but full of computers. And he said, then you go to use a computer, and you find that there isn't a mouse. The students have all pinched the mice. And he turned to the professor of community and said, is the plural of mouse oh. mice in computing, <laughs> or is it mouses? Professor of Computing Science said, I think that's a question of my learned friend in uh, English literature. Well, thank you very much. So we had a bit of debate about whether it was mouses or mice. He said to the principal, however, you know, so this person failing the examination in sociology might not have been able to get a mouse in the library. And we should therefore be sympathetic to the, the, the points that have been made. He said, however, principal, this library, which is the building when you go out, is up to the left, just letting the principal know where the library was. He said, my heart sings every day when I think of the library in the University of Glasgow, especially when I hear the fire brigade coming up and hope that the library is on fire. And it gives me great joy to think it might be. Anyway, that was his impassioned plea. And what he was um, essentially saying was, you know, you've got to watch libraries and knowledge and the nature of knowledge and all of that. What I want to make it really is about relationships. Relationship is at the heart of learning. I think relationships are at the heart of learning. And I also want to say it's about emotional and spiritual space. People interested in community knowledge have to pay attention not only to what is conventionally thought of as knowledge, but to the curiosity of our society, to the relationships you create, and to the emotional and spiritual space that people occupy. If I just fly through some of this. Um, there are a few diagrams. Yeah. I just want to... Oh, God. <laughs> Stop. Oh. <laughs> Where am I? What I wanted just to point out was that but when talking about some of this, you'll see these diagrams. I want to talk about people's values. Your personal self and your professional self. And what's the relationship between them? They are a unity. They are not separate. So community knowledge is about the whole person. What is that, the relationship between those two? Because sometimes I see people having this relationship where their professional stuff is just part of their personal lives. More frequently, I hear, especially in the teaching profession, people saying, I don't have a life of my own that is outside my professional life. That's a disaster. If you've got no personal life outside your professional life, then you need help. You need to talk to someone about it. And I see a lot of people in professional work nowadays in that condition. And I say, don't get, where's the space there? There's no space. And I, and I think a university has a responsibility to say, we can do something about that. And I suppose at the end of the day, you are asked this question, what kind of world do you want to live in? Is it one where you hear the songs of the birds or where you hear the clap of the cash register? And at the heart of community knowledge is the answer to that question. 
what do you want to see here? And I think we have a duty to let future generation hear the birds of the air.